I'm Jen Gerson, and I'm here with Matt Gurney. Here's us for this week's edition of The Line Podcast. Lots to talk about, including a pretty sudden carbon tax announcement, which is interesting. We're going to talk about free speech and why you should not shoot the surrendering. And Jen is going to, and apparently I should be very embarrassed about this, but she's going to explain to me who Buffy St. Marie is. All that and more as the podcast continues. I don't know if the carbon tax announcement that came on Thursday is going to ultimately end up being a defining moment for this government. I don't know. I don't make predictions. We we could, in theory, have two, two years almost exactly left on the calendar before the next election. But the announcement by the prime minister, uh, this was last night, and the announcement was that the uh, carbon tax on home heating fuel is going to be lifted if you are in Atlantic Canada. We could talk about that as public policy i guess but what really jumped out at me about that you can't not every slope is slippery but this one seems really slippery to me because everyone in atlanta canada who heats with propane is going to have questions this morning anyone in northern ontario who heats with fuel oil is going to have questions this morning everyone west of toronto is going to have a whole shitload of questions for the prime minister here can you crack this thing open a little bit without it cracking all the way open Yes. Okay. So firstly, let's talk about how the carbon tax is a centerpiece of Trudeau's time in government. It is is, one of the centerpieces. It is the, it's this and cannabis has been like the two top things. And childcare, I'd say. Yes. And and it's also been the issue in, I think, the last two elections, their defense of the carbon tax, the political capital that they've been willing to expend behind defending that part carbon tax, both politically and in court has been enormous. So for them to walk this back with their announcement, which suggested that for three years, they're going to like temporarily suspend the carbon tax, particularly specifically on heating oil. Not and specifically in Atlantic oil. Canada. Well, I don't know if it was. Okay. So heating oil, I think is only really an issue in Atlantic Canada. Is I think. The um, issue. Not literally. I mean, my cottage is on heating oil. You know why? Is it? Okay. No natural gas pipeline. No natural down the gas pipeline. Road. No, that's a shame. Um, and then also there's going to they're going to increase rebates as well for people in rural areas who are more dependent on carbon emissions and can't necessarily mitigate, for um, which pumps, has been yeah. a long standing uh, complaint. So I think that this is not the first time that we've seen the liberal government backtrack on a, on a policy file and to sort of follow in line with what the conservatives are doing. We've seen them do this on housing. Um, for example. But this is the first major policy file where we've seen this split. And and how and why I think is the is the more interesting aspect of it and the most obvious one. And that is, this is pork barrel politics at its most crude. So what's happening here is the Atlantic Canadian Liberal MPs are looking at their polling numbers and being like, well, we're fucked. Um, clearly, they went back to their caucus and have been wreaking havoc. Um, until they got some kind of concession. To me, we've been hearing rumors about internal caucus divisions for many, many months, Mm -hmm. um, and that Trudeau's grasp on his caucus is extremely tenuous. This, to me, is the first obvious public sign that that is true. Um, that, That for him to make a concession as politically damaging and embarrassing as this, in order to keep a significant and important faction of his caucus in line, uh, is 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 evidence that things are very, very not rosy and that his grasp on power is pretty tenuous. Now, there's two schools of thought on this. One school of thought says, um, as my husband has argued, that this means that the Trudeau government is going to try and stick this mandate out right to the bitter end. I'm on the other school of thought where I'm like, this is the first real example of chum being thrown into the water. And the second the chum gets thrown, the sharks start to circle. So once you've seen a government pander to one faction of its caucus, you're going to start to see divisions in other factions of its caucus as those other factions start to demand provisions and special treatment and all that kind of stuff. Um, once once power is broken, once weakness is shown, it's a really hard thing to ratchet back in. So we're going to see. I'm of a, of a mind where I tend to think that this increases the probability that we are going to have another election before the next two years is out. Other people disagree with me. Um, I don't know what the answer is, but that's that's what I would just throw out there. I would agree with most of that. Um, the only thing I would think I would disagree with you on is that it's not the first sign of it, it's the second, because we also had the ceasefire letter about a week ago. 
um ceasefire letter okay when 23 liberal mps like a sixth of the caucus broke with the government and said no it's time for canada to call for a ceasefire and it doesn't matter if canada calls for a ceasefire like this is stupid like we're not actually going to have a meaningful role to play in that but we what we now have is like twice in 10 days we have indications of either caucus unrest boiling over or we have indications of compromises being made to try and keep caucus unrest from boiling over i spoke uh on my radio show a couple of days ago susan delacourt w- was on with me and she was talking we were talking about this exact issue and the carbon tax thing hadn't even happened yet we were talking about it in the context of the ceasefire letter and susan had said to me i thought it was a really interesting observation which is that heading into the liberal caucus retreat a couple of uh, weeks ago we were all reading about the uh the anger in in the liberal caucus but it was all background sources like there's mm-hmm. nothing in, in the open uh, and they were unhappy about, first of all, the polling numbers, but also the cabinet shuffle, which uh, apparently a lot of them felt had been handled inelegantly. The Liberals have their big uh, uh, policy shindig in London, Ontario. And then that uh, grievances were aired, you know, steam Festivus, was vented. Festivus polls were, were erected. Yeah. And apparently, like, that helped things but what susan told me was just based on what what she's hearing and this is i'm not this is not me talking at school here she said this to me on my radio show on the air her sources are telling her that morale within caucus is as bad as it was before london and what's interesting is that you can see things governments do when they have to make changes and uh, this includes just for example a cabinet shuffle you know mm-hmm. oh things aren't going right we're going to do a cabinet shuffle or we're going to tweak a policy or things like that. The liberals are running through a pretty finite list of things you can do to try and right the ship. And I actually think that the actual proposal for the home heating oil is fine. Like as, as policy, like I don't care about it. Like, okay, so we're going to defer the carbon tax and we're going to amp up the, um, incentives to replace with a more uh environmentally friendly heating system it's not it's not fine because it it, it betrays a very key piece of of, of policy and legislation and it more also that, amps though. up it amps up grievances between the regions That's it. and what it like the idea that you're going to be able to say to a subset of the geographical population of the country using a subset of the fuel options that you guys are getting a break yeah, but there's something you're neighbor, morally better than 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 the other yeah. person who's yeah. And it was immediately noted last night. I think it was Andrew Leach, the economist, uh, who noted it immediately that like home heating oil is more carbon intensive than natural gas. Hmm. So you're basically saying to someone using a more environmentally friendly fuel, you are on the hook for the carbon tax, but this dude who's using a less environmentally friendly fuel gets a break for three years. Now you could argue with me that it's a temporary measure to encourage the uptake of uh, heat, heat pumps and it's things not. like that. We all know that's not what it is. I, see, I don't even care if it was because yeah. what it is to me, it's the door is now open a crack. Yes. And that's right. everyone in Atlanta, Canada who uses propane is going to be like, where's my sweet deal. Anyone who's not in Atlanta, Canada is be going, um, yeah, doesn't matter in Alberta and Saskatchewan because there's no liberal seats on the line there, but it's going to matter in Ontario and it's going to matter in BC. Absolutely. So anyway, I, I don't know if there's anything more to say, but beyond watch this space, but I agree. I hear you out with the, the ceasefire. The ceasefire letter is interesting to me, but it, it's really more of a indicative of ideological divisions. And there was no concession on that front. Like Trudeau didn't change his position yeah. based on the ceasefire letter. Right. This was a serious concession. And and I think that there are going to be ramifications for it. So a possible explanation for the ceasefire letter. And this is part of what I was talking about with Susan. This doesn't necessarily reflect a rebellion in the Liberal caucus. It could have reflected a concession on behalf of the PMO. It could have been the PMO saying, look, guys, we know you're in writings where this is really energizing. We know this is going to cause you guys some some bullshit here. We're not changing our position. We are opposed to a ceasefire until Israel has achieved its military objectives. But we're not going to punish you if you guys sign a letter calling for a ceasefire because you can use that in your constituencies. Right. Yeah, I even doubt that. I don't think that this was signed off by the PMO. I think that I don't know. MPs are well within their rights to sign open letters. 
they, they don't they don't need the pre- prime minister's permission to do that. Oh, they're well within their rights to do a lot of things they don't do. Yeah, fair a fair point, a fair play. So anyway, I'm not yeah, sure there's I agree. much. I don't have more anything to add, add to that, but that. But speaking of ceasefires and and the rest, there is a concern that Matt and I have. A concern. So Only when we one. started the line. We started the line because we sensed and perceived and saw a, a growing movement toward an increasingly illiberal position, particularly on free speech issues happening within the country. And we created the line in order to defend our rights to speak truthfully what we believe. We also read the um, quarterly statements of all the major media. Well, yeah, companies. that too. That too, definitely. Um, and now, I mean, as I've said in my this column, my week, my column this week, we do have a sense that there's a pendulum swift shift back away from that sort of extreme left liberal position. It's coming back to plumb, and now we got to wait and see whether or not the pendulum goes back into the crazy position on the conservative yep. side. And I think that our mandate and our our institutional mandate that we've created for ourselves was was to champion free speech and liberal values, regardless and of who's liberalism. Pushing. Yeah, and resist liberalism. Doesn't matter if that liberal liberalism is coming from the left or the right. Um, so now the pendulum is swimming, swinging back. We're going to be tested in the other way because I mean, you and I are both broadly sort of aligned center, center right, classical liberal style. So it's going to be it's easy for us to sort of say to people who we ideologically disagree with, say, "Well, you guys are full of shit, and we disagree with you." It's going to be a much harder for us to say to people who we are more aligned with, "We think you're over the line." And I think that we got our first opportunity to do that, really, in a long while. Um, Sarah Jama, who is an NDP MP in Ontario. MPP, yeah, Ontario legislator. It's a lot of consonants. Yeah. She's an NDP MPP. MP, you know, blah, 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 blah. Um, she basically put on Twitter something to the effect of she called for an immediate ceasefire on the is- Israel-Hamas conflict, as well as, quote, an end to all occupation of Palestinian land. This caused a very predictable backlash. Um, the NDP kicked her out of caucus. And then the Ontario legislature did something really over the line. And that was they essentially stripped her ability to speak. They used their majority power to strip, strip her ability to speak. They passed a, what they technically did. And I, I actually had to sure. look into the procedural element of this is they've passed a um, um a motion of censure. She has been yeah. censured by the House on the basis of the conservative majority voting that way. And until such time as she withdraws the offending remarks and apologizes for them, she shall not be recognized by the Speaker. Yes. So it's a very technical thing and it can exist. But this is the sort of thing you would normally do if somebody blows their top in a debate and calls someone a dick or something. Like you would pass a moment and you will be allowed to speak again when you calm down and withdraw and apologize for the remarks. Using it as a cudgel against a political position. Completely. Un- exactly un- un- that. No, that's completely unacceptable. Now, here's where I would say, point out, you and I are both pretty uh, uh, pro team. Israel has the right to defend itself. I think that that's safe to say. Israel has a right to defend itself. Israel has a right to defend itself. Um, Going to get coffee mugs made. Uh, but I'm also very pro pro free speech. And I think Sarah Jama has a right to and, and should have a moral right to be able to explain her position and and put those positions out there. I don't think anything that she has put out there, even though I disagree with it, it doesn't cross the line into criminal hate speech. Mm-hmm. Just doesn't. Doesn't meet that bar. She has a, a genuinely felt position. And I think that to use parliamentary powers and procedures to silence her in this way in the pursuit of her doing her duty, representing her constituents, is wildly inappropriate. I just don't think it's right. Um, now, it's within her, her constituents are within their rights to not vote for her again if they feel yep. like she doesn't represent them. That's totally fine. But this is an abuse of power. And this is exactly the kinds of abuse of power that the line started to defend against. And I think it's going to be very, very tempting for people on the in the center and the center right to take a punitive or vengeful kind of approach to this in the next couple of years and and to essentially shoot the shoot the surrenderers and say nope we're going to apply exactly the same liberal values to you as you tried to apply to apply to us fuck you fuck you fuck you and i would just say to people whom we otherwise might ideologically agree with don't because if you do that 
you're establishing a new set of liberal values that is going to be tied to social capital and power. You're going to prove the Wokies right by making free speech a, a tool and cudgel of power as opposed to um, a, a value in and of its own right. And that can only end in a kind of escalation of rhetorical shutting down and rhetorical violence that will be, again, used against us when the pendulum comes swinging back around again. There has to be somebody who's willing to put their, their, their stick up and say, nope, it's time to stop this. It's time to stop using these types of tools inappropriately. And it's time to accept that other people are going to have different points of view and they might be wrong and they might be misguided, but that doesn't mean that we're going to use inappropriate power to shut them down. And I would like to put my name very strongly on the record in support of Tara Sarah Jama's right to speak her speak her mind and to say her opinion. Now, that being said, I don't think the NDP is required to accept her back into their caucus. The NDP also has right of association. And if they mm -hmm. feel like Sarah Jam and her views are a liability to their political ambitions, they're a private club. They've got a right to do what they want. But she's still an elected constituent and her constituents have an expectation that they that they're, they're, they and their positions will be heard within, within with the legislature. And to shut her down this way is wildly over the line. I want to offer just a few bits of, of context here. Um, one of them, and I'm putting this down not as a prediction, but as a to be to be determined, something to watch. There are interesting rumblings coming out of Queen's Park that this is a problem within the NDP caucus. And I confess, I do not have great sources in the NDP caucus. They, they, um, they've, they've published, essentially, there have now been writing associations calling for uh, the resignation of Merritt Stiles, who is the yeah. head of the NDP, because she kicked them out of the caucus, because what, she kicked Sarah out of the caucus. What's bubbled up in public is not as interesting as what I'm hearing Fair through enough. other channels. Um, so that's just worth watching. And I'm going to leave it there. I, I think we'll just see what happens on that. What I'm also going to say is that it's important to remember the context, and this is not a defense of it. It's not even adding condemnation to it. I'm just mentioning for non-Ontario listeners, you have to understand that beating up on Sarah Jama was a godsend for Doug Ford, who was having a bad few weeks. Hmm. And Doug Ford just recently um, had found out that the RCMP was going to have a criminal probe into the development of the Green Belt. And there has been a continued trickle of revelations of people with links to Ford having had, or at least the having had a possibility of financially benefiting from the green belt here. The green belt has been forced a little bit out of uh, the headlines because the world is on fire, but it's still a live issue at the Ontario legislature. And I don't know if this was noticed abroad but most of the most vicious attacks by the progressive conservatives against sarah jama and the ndp were when they were asked about the green belt and it wasn't hmm. like they would stand up and go you know mr speaker sarah jama is bad it was 100 percent being weaponized to provide political cover for the ford conservatives i'm not asking anyone to change their mind on the key issue i just wanted to put that on the record as part of this in the big sense, though, I agree with you 100%. Um, and I, the other angle, first of all, I'm going to agree with you on all the principled things you've said about free speech, um, the, the importance of, of democratic exchange. There's two other issues, though, and they're both pragmatic. Sarah Jamma's constituents have a right to representation in the legislature. And she is allowed to vote, but she's not currently allowed to speak. And that's not how it works. There are thousands of people who live in her riding yeah. who deserve to have effective representation. If they don't like her, they can kick her out of the next election. That's the system we have, and I don't like trying to cudgel it on the fly. The other thing I would say, and this is what I've been saying for weeks, I'm not arguing with anybody about the Middle East. I want everybody, everybody to have their say on the matter, and I'll take notes. And when you don't let people speak, you are denying them the opportunity to reveal themselves for what they are. Yeah, you're denying everybody else the opportunity to hear what they have to say. That's, to that's just that's, to a, it. that's a that's not a denial just of the person doing the speaking. It's a denial to uh -huh. the person who potentially would do the listening. I want um, Sarah Jama to have her say, and I want everyone in the world to step up and agree or disagree with it because I find this all a useful sorting exercise. The other thing that I would say is like this also goes beyond Sarah Jama. Of course, there have been a lot of pro-Palestinian protests that have happened in recent weeks, and many of those Palestinian protests have devolved into things like yelling at Toronto delis, Jewish delis and things like that, which Cafes, is obviously, yeah. obviously anti-Semitic and, and, and isn't appropriate. Um, 
balanced against that, we've seen a lot of nations do things like threaten to export students who who are on here on North American countries and student visas who participate in these protests. That is wildly inappropriate. Sorry, it's interesting. It's it's wildly inappropriate. You should not be threatening to export students, kids, because they are engaging in a protest against uh, even if i personally find those protests reprehensible I, that does not meet the standard of violence that is that that for, to my mind would be an acceptable reason to deport someone on a student visa like if a student visa if a person on a student visa is you know actively trying to like organize a terrorist cell or something okay fine then they've crossed the line into something that i could see exporting but merely participating in a protest no that's the, you've gone you've 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 lost the plot when you're arguing for that. Well, let me ask you the question then. Let me let me ask you about the edge cases. This is where the tough laws will be made. This is the, the edge cases are always the tough laws. When it look, I I agree with you. If someone wants to ch wave a Palestinian flag and talk about humanitarian conditions in Gaza, that's part of democracy. What about someone chanting from the river to the sea? Is that protest or is that incitement to genocide? And that's going to be where things are going to get ugly. I think it sort of depends on the intent of the protest. I mean, we saw Fred Hahn from QP basically tweet that exact same thing. Um, I think I think QP at this point would like Fred Hahn to be deported. Yeah, um, exactly. But no, I, mean, I, I do it depends think some on what of these the, protests are pushing the, the edge on, into criminal hate speech. Yeah, I mean, it depends on the intent. It depends on the intent. The, the, as I said, the bar for criminal hate speech is really high, as it ought to be. Yeah. It, it's real high. It, I think it. I think the bar is way higher than from the river to the sea. I think the bar is is. I mean, I don't want to repeat some of the things I've horrors that I've heard in the last two weeks. Mm -hmm. Certainly, there's some stuff that has crossed that line. But look, we have to. We have to. If we're going to maintain a, a liberal society that permits pluralism and permits diversity of views, our tolerance for hate speech has to be a lot higher than what you and I personally might be comfortable with. And we have to be consistent in believing that even when we're talking about people who we profoundly disagree with. Perhaps the the, the onus is on us even more so in those cases. The, otherwise um, you're otherwise you do, otherwise free speech does just become a cudgel of social power. I I think my position on this is more nuanced than yours. And it's not that I disagree with you in a philosophical sense, but it's just that so I was looking at this week and I think I think you're responding to this. You haven't mentioned them directly, but I think this is part of your response. Uh, the Home Office in the United Kingdom put out a memo mm -hmm. to police forces where they basically said uh, a lot of these protests have been democratically valid and legal, but some of them have been edging over into incitements to violence, harassment, things like mm -hmm. that. And in the case where arrests are made, and if we discover that someone uh, involved in these things is here on a temporary visa, whether it's a work permit or a student visa, let us know and we will remove them for the country. That is ripe for abuse. Yeah. But my concern in this country, and it is not an abstract concern, it is linked to seeing how we have handled all of the recent crises that we have prepared, is that Canadian public policy responses are conditioned to under respond. And I don't like I agree with you. We should have an incredibly high bar for what meets the context of of criminals of criminal hate speech. Like you and I are probably broadly in agreement on this. Don't issue death threats don't criminally yeah. harass someone don't send pictures of naked kids and don't like call for a genocide like these things are actually are carved out already by canadian yes. law yeah but one of the concerns that i have is that our police are not going to want to investigate this our courts are too dysfunctional to try it and no politician is going to want to get their hands dirty having any enforcement here and i think i i think i agree with you on the philosophical Part yeah, but of this? you can't you can't resolve that by in implementing blanket bans that we know will then be abused. But right? I think like, what none I'm of that's resolvable that in that way. I, in a de facto way, I'm not convinced there is any effective anti hate speech, anti criminal incitement enforcement happening in this country right now. Potentially, but I'm saying that's a problem look, too. If, if somebody if somebody if somebody is actually arrested for, I mean, the, the example we would we would point to from last week was the um the quote unquote protesters who started to scream into the windows of a Jewish deli in Toronto in the land of yeah. okay, yeah. I ordered their lunch and I built it to the line by the way. I, I'm fine with that. Um thought you would be you know if that behavior crossed the line into arrest then arrest them. 
you know what I mean? Like, like police are at, are, are, are at these protests uh, appropriately. You know, if these things cross the line into harassment and, 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 and an arrestable and indictable offense, great. I have no problem with arresting and indicting people who, who, who break the law. Um, and there's always going to be an uncomfortable gray area, but the lack of the police is the, the police's inability to respond doesn't, doesn't make the argument for a more stringent or blanket standard of, of suffocating pr protester debate. In fact, it makes the exact opposite argument. If our police don't have the internal capacity to respond with the tools that they have, more legislation only exacerbates the problem and creates more of an opportunity for abuse of those problems. So, you know, you've got to address the problems where they are and not try and think that we can create some kind of top-down fix for these issues. Um, you know, there, there's a now a significant percentage of the population that's pro-Palestine. Uh, and a smaller subsection of that, of that population is not just pro-Palestine, but pro-use of atrocity to... Pro-destruction of Israel. Pro-destruction of Israel. You know, we can't legislate those views out of existence. We can only address them and create them and and, and challenge them and, and expose the people who hold those views and challenge those, those peoples with their with their assumptions. Right. I mean, all this goes back to the call, first column you wrote about a lot of this stuff. And that is a lot of the people who are strongly pro-Palestine going pro-Hamas. And there are a couple of those, too they haven't actually been exposed to the atrocity. <laughs> they're, they're, they're either in willful denial or they're in a different information universe. So they are not completely aware of just how um, wildly horrific some of Hamas's actions in recent week has been, weeks have been. You know, you can't address that informational problem by saying, shut the fuck up or we'll deport you. Or for, or for or for essentially threatening the same, that's not the answer here. The answer actually has to be to try and say, well, look, I hear where you're coming from, and I can have empathy for the Palestinian cause in abstract. But have you seen the video? <laughs> you know what I mean? Like, um, are you really sure you're familiar with Hamas's charter? Because it's easily Googleable. Like, I, I don't think that a lot of these people would necessarily be on board in the numbers they've been on board if they had a full understanding of what Hamas was and what it was doing. Maybe that's optimistic. Well, that's what we're known for here, our, uh, optimism. our relentless optimism. Uh, speaking of relentless optimism, though, what I'm going to say to you, Jen, is I, I understand with and broadly agree the philosophical argument you're making, but I think the counter argument to it, and I agree with you, it doesn't mean that we need new powers or new sweeping legislation. I think what we're looking at here is more like an enforcement gap where one of the things that I can, I, how do I'm trying to, I have to, I have to be careful how I say this. I don't want to burn any uh, privileged conversations. It is my mm -hmm. sense that the Jewish community, particularly in Toronto right now does not have faith in the willingness of the Toronto police service or the ability of the Toronto police service to protect them. Hmm. And I think that's a problem. It's, it's, a, and that's, it's a huge fucking problem because I think they're right. And I think what could happen, we're talking about pendulum swings and a liberalism. When the uh, uh, Cafe Landwar incident happened um, earlier in the week, and again, just if, if anyone's missed the reference, that's um, the, it's a franchise. There's a series of them. It's uh, Jewish-owned businesses uh, that make great schnitzel. And that's what I ordered for lunch this week. And thank you to line subscribers for picking up the tab on that. Um, that is not a comment on Gaza. And when you have, as we've had reported as well, and there's photos of this protests outside of community centers in Toronto that are Jewish yeah. community centers. When you have CTV news reported on Thursday that Winnipeg police are looking for a suspect or suspects after a uh, gunfire was pumped through the windows of a house with a mezuzah, a Jewish religious symbol on the door. At a certain point, if you if the if communities don't think that the state is willing or capable of protecting them, you're not just looking at a problem in terms of a crisis of democracy. You're looking at an inflammatory escalator. Yeah. And so far, I think people have responded mostly rationally. 
But I have anecdotal indicators uh, that I cannot quantify yet. The data simply would not exist yet. I will put this as neutrally as I can. I have anecdotal indicators that there is currently a movement, at least in Toronto, and I suspect in other cities, of people increasing their ability to protect themselves, including with force if necessary. People are taking actions they would have not taken a month ago. And one of the reasons they're taking it is because when there's people walking around going from the river to the sea, the response of a big part of the Canadian intelligentsia has been, well, we have a very high threshold for hate crimes in this country. I think you're conflating two different problems. I don't think I am. No, no. Uh, firstly, because what you're what you're saying there is you're 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 assuming that because I don't necessarily want to immediately imprison everybody who says from the river to the sea that I somehow have a tolerance for violence against Jewish people, and I don't. Um, the second problem is an enforcement problem or an enforcement gap can only be addressed through enforcement means. Mm -hmm. You can't fix the enforcement gap by shutting down protests. All right. Like that's not going to make these ideas or these positions go away. It's only going to push them underground. Well, and that would, makes them potentially more, more dangerous where they could be would potentially that? more dangerous. I mean, honestly, mm -hmm. like it, two, two members of the Canadian community today who feel as though, they are in danger and the state is unwilling or unable to protect them. What reassurance can we offer them? Well, you and I can't offer them anything because you and I are just two fucking hacks sitting around. Well, what would we like to see happen then that might reassure them? Well, firstly, I think that that's a conversation that for the Toronto Police Service needs to have with the Jewish, with the Jewish community. And I think that, that the, the roots of that come start with, with community policing. And maybe you and I can do a little bit more research about things that the police could be doing. Well, they've set up command um, centers in Jewish neighborhoods. Yeah. So that's, that, and that needs like that. Great. I mean, this is a, this, this is parallel to a conversation that we've been having in journalism about the harassment that can, that routinely yeah. gets flung against, yeah. against journalists and the degree that when we call the cops, to what extent do they answer or take these concerns seriously when the, when, when we're talking about criminal harassment? And actually, that hasn't zero. been my experience. That hasn't been my experience. The one time I called the cops because I was having a reader criminally harass me, they showed up and they took it very seriously. Um, did but they take know, your statement or did they do anything to the reader? They did No, they did both. They took mm -hmm. my statement and they confronted the reader, who was a bit of a known gadfly. Mm -hmm. um, so my experience has been very positive. I've been, my, my police have been very professional in, in dealing with these issues and they've taken my issues very seriously. So I don't, that hasn't been my experience, but I know it's been the experience of other people that when they have been criminally harassed, the police have definitely thrown up their arms and been like, nothing we can do. When was your so, experience? Recent? No, no, this was years ago, a couple years ago. Right. Um, and my experience wasn't like lots of people are mean to me on Twitter. I mean, I was getting 20 no, to 30 yeah, no, phone calls per day from this person from various different locations around the city, right? Like it was very clearly over the line. And this was somebody who was known to police. Police took my statement and then they basically showed up at the guy's door and was like, fucking quit it. Sorry, I'm swearing a lot today. I told work. him to quit it and he did. So it was taken seriously and it was it was dealt with and it was resolved. Um, but look, I mean, this is this. I would just reiterate this point. If the problem is with lack of trust between the Jewish community and the Toronto police service, that can't be resolved by shutting down shitty protests. If the problem is a lack of enforcement capacity by the police, that can only be resolved by increasing resources to the police. If the, if the issue is, is lack of will among the police, that can only be resolved by addressing that with leadership in the police shutting down protests is going to fix none of those problems literally not a single one my experience a few years ago was not the same as yours um there was a gentleman who had a a history of uh threatening journalists um and and to be very clear the gentleman was mentally ill um mm -hmm. among other problems he had it, it included mental illness including believing uh, that he was a, a reincarnation of previous historical figures and that uh, my articles as well as others were uh, code, uh, that there was code embedded mm -hmm. in what we were saying that was being uh, signaling a subversive agenda to his enemies. And the harassment escalated to the point where uh, he was uh, trying to, and he was, he was telling me exactly how he was doing it. He was trying to figure out where I lived where my wife worked, where my kids went to school, and he had be begun staking out the National Post building on Don Mills. Uh, and he explained to me exactly where he was going to set up the rifle that he would use to shoot me with as I stepped out of the door. Mm -hmm. Luckily, he had the wrong entrance, so he was probably just going to pick off some poor delivery guy. The police were aware of this, 
They took reports. But what eventually happened was that this guy was dumb enough to threaten a cop. And then he was arrested. Mm. Funny how that happens. Mm -hmm. Eventually, uh, this gentleman eventually killed himself. He he is no longer an issue. Um, I, I Jen, I don't think I disagree with you about the challenges we face here, but I think this is the concern I have and that others have as well. There will not be a willingness to do anything preemptively until after something tragic has happened that yeah, then we, just... we will suddenly discover, well, perhaps better enforcement of these protests and perhaps yeah. enforcing who has a permit to protest where uh, perhaps making arrests for things that could be construed as incitement to violence. And let the courts sort it out later after someone has been identified and it goes through a process of determining what exactly constitutes that. Until and unless that happens, the community will continue to feel unprotected. And if it only happens after something tragic has happened, that's a problem, too. I, 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 I the last person in the world who wants the Jewish community, community to feel unprotected, protected in Canada is me. However, I would say um there is a real emotional pull from people who have been on the wrong side of what I would call broadly woke politics, whatever you want to call it, to say, ha, 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 the pendulum's coming our way yeah. now, bitches. Oh, I agree with that. And it's going to be really, really tempting and emotionally gratifying to be like, we'll show you. We'll fucking show you. We'll shut you down. But is, we'll is show there... you what's acceptable. We'll show you what the Overton window is. And I feel that myself and I, I I feel that I can, I feel, imagine that it can only be compounded when you're somebody of Jewish descent who's watched what's happened and who is, is also feeling insecure about your personal safety. However, I would just caution, don't make the mistake that I think a lot of on the liberal left have made of allowing your emotional responses to overwhelm your values because and your ethics because that only leads us to a place where these sorts of um wild pendulum strings between extreme right and extreme left become more and more extreme and with each pendulum the string of the pen with each swing of that pendulum you get more destructive the, it yeah, becomes further more destructive and, further from the center. and the norms get de and the norms get depleted a little bit more somebody has got to say stop there was and um i'm going to be one of those people who says stop there's a term you and I were kicking around a little bit. We've alluded to it during the podcast. We were kicking a, a little uh, around a bit before, which is shooting the surrendering, which right now has a very yeah. specific context, yeah. uh, but we mean it in a more of a metaphorical sense. An entirely metaphorical sense. Yeah. When when the pendulum swings in a, in a cultural war, there will be people who would have been ideological opponents who changed their minds. Mm -hmm. And kind of what you're talking to, there's an emotional compulsion to to say well where the fuck were you three years ago or to go who the hell are you now to pretend like you felt this way all along but there's an intellectual who are you now to pretend to pretend to gaslight us and pretend that there was no woke takeover and this was all a figment of our imaginations because you wouldn't have had the balls to say that three years ago yeah and now well, well, we, i think what you and i are calling for is in the realm of political converts we're calling for forgiveness and a second chance because it's good it's good for all kinds of reasons when the enemy throws down the metaphorical arms and surrenders. But I do not think that that is the same thing as people like if someone basically wants to go, I think I was too far out there in my political activism. Okay. I don't have the same tolerance and forgiveness for those who either through considered thought or raging emotions we're pushing into the at least the gray area of criminality. I think mm -hmm. a, pr a prof who drank too much Cupid Kool Aid is not the same thing as a guy screaming outside the community center. Well, actually, in some cases, it probably is the same, but you know what I mean. Yeah. I mean, look, over the last couple of years, we've seen a lot of uh, municipalities, for example, put in place things like uh, protest barriers to protect trans people outside of libraries. Yeah. Uh, Let's see those same kinds of protest barriers put in place to protect Jewish community centers. Mm -hmm. You know, fine. You know, like I, I have no issue with that. Um, and like I said, if if there are safety and enforcement issues, yeah, I, I think let's let's be proactive about being on call to have those resolved because I think those are legitimate concerns. And I'm not trying to underplay the safety concerns there. Did you see um, the footage out of New York this week? No, but I kind of want to pivot away to and keep it in Canadian sphere if that's all right. Is that okay? 
to the yeah sure but to the extent i would say the jewish community does not limit its twitter viewing to canadian news no that's true my only concern is that i'm looking at the time really more yeah you got to pick up your kid yeah i got to pick up my kids um so all right and there's two more issues that we got to get into um one is buffy saint marie and then the last one is a discussion about heading babies so you have to tell you you already sort of were like, surprised by this. You got to explain to me who Buffy St. Marie is. Buffy and I'm not Saint doing Marie. this for okay. affectation. I have no idea. All right. Who so this is, this is, a, this is a big story that's come out of, of, of CBC and it's, it's, uh, I, I would say dominating the discourse in Canada right now. And this is Buffy St. Marie is an ostensibly first nations or indigenous woman who has is now, in I think in her eighties, seventies or eighties, who is probably the most famous Canadian first nations folklore artist. I think that, you know, if you were to say, Name a First Nations uh, uh, recording artist in Canada who is the most famous, those most iconic, most well-known. Buffy St. Marie is probably it. So earlier this week, Buffy puts out this um, preemptive statement that says, essentially, there's there's going to be a CBC article questioning who I am. I don't know exactly where I am, but I was adopted into a First Nations group. And uh, all of these allegations are very hurtful to me. And a lot of people... This was very effective in um, PR inoculation. I mean, Matt and I are cynical enough that we will recognize this for a PR strategy. One of the things that people who know that they're forked will do ahead of a story is they'll try to preempt the story with an inoculation inoculation statement, which will which will try to muddy the waters ahead of the, the actual story maneuver. coming out. Yeah. So what this told me was, and I don't want to get sued here, but what this told me was that the CBC had her dead to rights. Buffy knew it, and she went she wanted to get ahead of the story. Um, and then the story came out today, uh, Friday, and in fact, the CBC does have her dead to rights. Um, the CBC story is absolutely thorough. It's utterly ironclad. It demonstrates and tracks 50 years of conscious and at times malicious deceit about her background and ancestry. I mean, Buffy St. Marie is actually Beverly Santa Maria, who, a white, an Italian white American who was born in Massachusetts. Um, and began claiming, spuriously claiming Indigenous and ancestry from a very early age. And her family um, has a long record of pointing this out and speaking out about it, and at times being threatened by legal suits and sometimes threats of of, of worse to shut, the, to shut the hell up. I mean, the CBC tracked down her actual original birth record. They um, have the receipts. They documented in very careful detail the um, discontinuities in Buffy's own claims and her own heritage state. Buffy St. Mary was adopted into a a, um, First Nations community, I believe in Saskatchewan, in her 20s. And there are many people out there saying, well, she was adopted into a First, she is accepted by a community. And I don't dispute that. Nobody does. There were two issues with that, and that is the questions about whether or not she was adopted into this community on false pretenses is 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 pretty interesting. And then the other thing is, even if she was adopted into this community, that doesn't that doesn't undermine the deception she's engaged in in order to portray herself as indigenous. And and as the CBC rightly points out in the story, part of her her, her claimed ancestry is part of why she became famous. She got many rewards and, and things that were specifically allocated for indigenous women and indigenous artists. So when you have somebody of non-indigenous um, descent claim those, it, it becomes questionable. So anyway, I don't really care personally whether or not she has this quantum of blood or not, that that's not the issue. The issue is the 50 years of conscious deception. It, that's the problem here. Um, from my perspective. And and as I said, I think that the CBC's more or less got her dead to rights. It's another pretty classic example of the pretendian story. It's really very sad. And I think that there are a lot of people who in First Nations communities, just judging from Twitter, who are reacting very emotionally to it and sort of reflexively defending her because um, she she is such an iconic figure in these communities. And I, I empathize with that really greatly. And as I my position, this is like the truth does stop you from from lionizing her the truth doesn't stop you from enjoying her music or valuing her it's just the truth you can take it or leave it um but i, I mean i'm looking at the story as a journalist perspective and I, I i think the cbc nailed it i just don't think there's wiggle they did they left they left no, no wiggle room here 
I, I mentioned a minute ago the Gomeshi maneuver, and for, mm-hmm. for readers who uh, listeners who don't know what I mean by that, but I know Jen, I, I saw the way you nodded, so you got it. Mm-hmm. Years ago, uh, Gian Gomeshi, uh, former CBC radio host, put out a statement basically being like, Hey guys, I've been going through some really tough stuff lately, and uh, pretty soon there's going to be some uh, allegations coming out about me, but mm-hmm. I want you to all know that I'm okay and I'm working on my health. And I remember at the time looking at that. And I, I didn't know him well, but I mem- remember I sent him like a note. And I was like, hey, man, like, good luck to you, whatever is uh, going on with your life. It was such a it was such a vague statement of like, I'm really going through a tough time right now. And then the allegations came out. I was like, yeah. So ev- any time I've seen a preemptive pre-positioning statement ahead of a story. And just to break the fourth wall, people should know the way this happens is before a news organization runs a story like this, yeah. there is a professional obligation and, and a legal in case obligation. Of litigation, a legal obligation yeah. that you present the, a series of detailed questions to the subject and give them a reasonable time frame to respond. Yeah. And uh, there are occasional exceptions to that. Like, you, you know, the, there are, it's not ironclad, but it gives you a much stronger case in the event of litigation. And what this also means, and it's just, Part of the cost of doing business in journalism is that your subject becomes aware of the fact that you are investigating them and the questions will give them at least a sense of how you will respond to them. And there was a recent example of this uh, in a different context a few months ago. The Toronto Star went to former Toronto Mayor John Tory with a series of questions related to information they had suggesting that he had been having an affair with a staffer. The Tory campaign um, asked for an extension on time to permit family discussions, and the star granted that. And then John Tory resigned. You know, he answered the questions or had a lawyer respond to them. I, I don't know all the details on that. That's one way of doing it. The other way is to go full counteroffensive on Twitter before the story even comes out, and that is what Buffy St. Marie has done. Is it yeah. a is it bad that I literally had no idea who this person was? And I'm not saying this. Yeah, I mean, for, for for a Laurentian elite like you, that's sort of bad form. You should I, really be aware of major Canadian iconic figures. When I heard stage. Buffy St. Marie, I honestly thought that this was like a Josh Whedon thing. And that Buffy, I'm not kidding, that Buffy St. Marie was the full name of Buffy the Vampire Slayer. And yeah, then I enough. began seeing pictures of Buffy St. Marie. And I'm like, no, no that's not Sarah Michelle that's Gellar. Not, no, that's definitely not Sarah Michelle Gellar. Anyway. I don't know what to say to people who are Buffy fans. I, all I would say is the, the, the truth doesn't diminish your appreciation of her or her work in any meaningful way. It's just the truth. So you I've still... never been someone who has a hard time enjoying the art of someone I find reprehensible for other reasons. Roger yes. Waters is a disgusting anti-Semite, but I really like Pink Floyd. I'm not a huge Michael Jackson fan, but there's a few songs of his that I like, and I don't worry about the other stuff. O.J. Simpson was hilarious as Nordberg in the Naked Gun movies. Like, I, this doesn't pose problems for me, but I think we do live in an era of, well, of cancellation. And yeah. it's more, it's awkward for others. Yeah, and the other thing I would just say is like, look, it, it's not whether or not she's, she's her ancestry as First Nations isn't the problem. Like, I don't, nobody cares. The, the problem is that there she's deceptive. She has been demonstrably deceptive about it over a significant period of time and in ways that were called out in a very ironclad way. Um, I mean, God bless Robert Jago, whom I really like, but he just, he's on Twitter today saying really silly things. Robert, I love you. But he said something to the effect of Jordan Peterson was uh, claimed to be adopted into a First Nations tribe. I checked it out. He was, I accept his, his, his connection to First Nations people and story. And if we, we accept this from Jordan Peterson, we should accept this from Buffy St. Marie. And I'm like, that's dumb. Jordan Peterson is not claiming to be literally indigenous. He's not, he didn't spend 50 years deceiving people claiming to have been like a non-white dude. Like he he never claimed that. (laughs) He's not lied about any of this. Look, yeah, my Jewish friends gave me honorary Jewish status a few years ago, but if someone asked me, I'm still united. (laughs) Yeah, yeah, pretty much. (laughs) So anyway, like it's, 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 it's the lying. That's the problem, Right. Anyway, um, this just wanted to bring me back. Like, hey, we only have a few more minutes. I did want to just stress, address eight this. eight minutes because, here. You want to because, talk about the CBC? Well, no, I want to talk about the baby beheading because I did promise some people who emailed me and some of our readers that I would. Um, this we go was, with the less uh, depressing option? Wow. Yeah, well, yeah, so I can't because now we did. Right. I did promise this. All right. Um, so anyway, I got a couple of emails in response to my last uh, 
column. We are going to have a couple of rebuttals for that column. So I'm really looking forward to that. But a couple of people said. The one about the left having shown its whole ass. Yeah, the, the left the left having its mask off. And I, I made mention to quote unquote baby beheadings a couple of times. Um, and I had a couple of people saying, no, the baby beheadings thing is a myth. Here's a Snopes article about it. Hamas is, has um, done terrible and atrocious things, but they didn't do this. Don't get fooled kind of thing. Yeah. Um, and a lot of these comments were not meant in a way that meant to discredit any of my position. They were very good faith comments, and I do appreciate those sorts of things. However, I do believe they're wrong. And this is based on some of the research that you've done on this. So there was a bit of a muddle on this issue. And I just wanted to turn it over to you to try and explain this because you are going to be able to explain it better than I I can. Well, a couple of weeks ago, shortly after the attacks, there was a report in broken English given to an English language reporter that women and children had their heads chopped. And then I think we talked about this in one of our earlier podcasts. What happens is that that single report from a single source to a single reporter was picked up widely by other news outlets over the world and reported on. Mm-hmm. And that created uh, an appearance of multiple source confirmation. I mm-hmm. looked into it and read all these reports, and I realized that they all trace back to the same interview in broken English uh, with one reporter from one soldier. And I told you at the time, because you'd obviously seen the reports on Twitter, and I was like, mm, don't say anything yet. Like, let's. Yeah, and I, d- and I didn't, and neither did you. Both, neither of, our, did I. both of us were really careful because we were concerned about this being um, either wrong. PSYOPs or Infowar or wrong. just wrong. Yeah. Yeah. By the next day, CBS News citing multiple soldiers, witnesses, and journalists, as well as eventually medical examiners, were reporting that there were beheaded babies. And the remaining nuance is was and is whether or not they were decapitated by having – fuck, I hate saying this – I don't know if their heads were sawn or chopped off or if they popped off because they were being their bodies were being destroyed with high powered bullets and explosives. That right. seems okay. to be about okay. the remaining degree of nuance here. And okay. what happened is that after um some of the news media had gotten carried away and made claims that went beyond what the evidence is and those claims were retracted. And very specifically there had been a claim that in one kibbutz that 40 children had been beheaded. I remember that. And then I remember how that being not right. There was a conflation between there were 40 dead children in this community and that children had been beheaded and it became 40 children were killed by beheading. Right. And that was inaccurate. And that was withdrawn. And I think what has happened with a lot of people since then has been, ah, that story was withdrawn. And people have been sending me links about this too. Mm -hmm. And the links are all 10 or 12 days old. So right. people are like, ha ha, have you seen this withdrawal? So There's the been with- a succession of media interviews, government statements, and commentary by medical examiners that talk about the mutilation of the, of these bodies, some of which are in pieces here. I don't know if they brought along a little guillotine, but like at a certain point, what we're looking at here, I don't know if it's deliberate info war, but I think we're looking at a real-time story of why when the media gets something wrong, it, it's a problem. So just to, just to clarify here, there was an initial story of 40 children beheaded in a kibitz that was with probably based on a broken broken uh, uh, English Telephone, soldier yeah. interview, one single source. Yep. That story was withdrawn, but in the two weeks after that, it did come out that there were examples of, of children and babies being beheaded in, in other in other circumstances. That's essentially, essentially yeah. I mean, okay. yes. I mean, that's I mean, that's a lot of information, but yeah. And the medical examiners in Israel, the 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 shit they're having to do. Like just to be believed is pretty remarkable here. And I, I agree with you. Most of the people I think who have gotten in touch are believe that we have failed to see the retraction of the 40, 40 be, uh, beheaded children's story, yeah, yeah. but they haven't been paying attention to what the medical examiners and what soldiers and re- right. first responders and government officials at the scene have said. There was another related issue to this. And we talked on the podcast last week as well about this, Jen, which was that there's been a strong denial of rape. Uh, yeah. uh kind of like resistance is glorious but rape is cowardly and how there's been whoa, whoa, whoa we we wouldn't do that sort of thing one of the things that's been coming out of it jen is uh, awful as it is the medical examiners in some of these communities have been saying we have female victims ranging from childhood to elderly years whose pelvises have been crushed by the force of the rapes yeah and that was that was the, that was the knowledge that i couldn't get out of my head yesterday and no one, it, 
one of those things like when I saw the first image on the day of the attacks where I saw a woman who was bleeding between her legs intellectually, I had no problem. Like my my left side of my brain filed that at information accurately. But the right side of my brain had to work through some stuff before balance was achieved. Yeah. And I so think anyway. reading these medical examiner reports or listening to the interviews where they're talking about, we don't even know if we can get DNA samples from some of these bodies, or we don't even know how many dead people are here because they've been put into such tiny pieces. There's an intellectual understanding of that. And then there's an emotional understanding of that. And I think a lot of us are on two tracks, two speed tracks on those. Yeah. Yeah. So anyway, I didn't want to belabor this point and, and horrify people even more trigger warning. Huh? Um, late on that one, but yeah, but yeah. But I did think that we, I promised to address it in, in, in the podcast, and I think we have, and that is, yes, we're standing by baby beheadings, that 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 reflects our understanding of the situation at based present. Based on multiple if, sources on the on scene, multiple reported sources multiple on the scene. outlets. If, if that is something that uh, evolves or changes in coming weeks, months, that's fine, we'll address that then, but that is our understanding that that is accurate. Um, I, think- I have like maybe 10 minutes if you want to talk CBC, but- I don't know. Yeah, I mean, to... maybe because I, I think I'd prefer not to leave this on crushed pelvises. Yeah, um, that's what, that's horrific. Yeah, thank you. What I will say uh, on this note, and this is me being a little dark, forgive me, but Jen, one of the problems we have is that we're dealing with two kinds of um, skepticism right now. A lot of people saw the withdrawal of that story of the 40 beheaded children. President Biden also said, I've seen photos of beheaded babies. And then the White House is like, well, no, he was told about photos of beheaded babies. So yeah. people have seen these stories and they're naturally and understandably their skepticism's up. Yeah, I got no problem with those people. I get it. Yeah. And I hope yeah. that what we're talking about here and what we'll put in our dispatch help cl- clarify that. Yeah. But there are also people who will simply never believe this. Yeah. And that's okay, too. Like I said at the beginning of the podcast, I am uh, every, this is an opportunity for 8 billion human beings to reveal themselves for what they are. A lot of these people could be present in the autopsy chamber and they would still not believe it. And I'm okay with that. Like I don't change people's minds. So to the people of good faith, we're here to work with you. To the people who aren't go fuck yourselves. Let's talk. We, we've got, you got, uh, you, you want about five, 10 minutes, you think? I got like five or 10 minutes. And I, I agree with you. This is a very dark space to be leaving a podcast off on. Do you want to talk briefly about the CBC? Click like and subscribe. Yeah. yeah so let's like, talk like and CBC. Subscribe. CBC. So CBC, sort of the, we talked about a little, little bit about this last week, about how the CBC had, had decided as a matter of policy not to use the word terrorism mm-hmm. um, unless it was attributed, right? Attributed. As so we noted last week, they are inconsistent. They're not perfectly inconsistent, but it's really hard to, I would say it's really hard to be inconsistent on that particular file, particularly when you're dealing with a country where we have literal terrorism charges and you have, Mm -hmm. you know, our our government designates terror organizations. Like it's, 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 it's a thing. It's really hard to work against that kind of tide when you're a news organization. However, they, they've chosen an intellectually defensible position. It's not the good position in our particular, but it's, it's defensible. Yep to not use this word unless it's been attributed. So they'll call Hamas a terrorist if it's like Justin Trudeau calls Hamas terrorists, but they won't use that in straight straight copy because- Yeah, they wouldn't say something like, Israel today killed 12 terrorists during a battle right. on the Gaza border fence. That's right. Um, and that's because, I mean, from them, for them, from their perspective, the word terrorism is really politically and emotionally loaded. Um, from our perspective, it, it can be, but Hamas is not the edge case. Um, anyway, so we talked about that last week. What's interesting about this week is that the conservatives in parliament have decided to escalate this one step further. You've had um, Rachel Thomas, Thomas or Herder, I keep on forgetting her maiden and, and her and her non-maiden name, sorry, um, are calling on CBC to account for this this uh, position, they want to call in not just the president, uh, Catherine Tate, but also the head of the journalistic standards and practice. They're really escalating the political rhetorical war against CBC mm-hmm. using the word terrorism and their terrorism policy as a cudgel. And here's where I would point out the CBC may be technically right, but they're losing and they don't understand that they're playing yet. So the CBC has the right to determine its own internal policy and its own style guide around Absolutely. the use of the word terrorism. Absolutely. 
they, they completely do. And this should not be interfered with by parliament. 100%. That said, but the CBC doesn't seem to realize that it is a now wittingly or otherwise a pawn in a political war between the conservatives and the conservatives base and their agenda. And they don't seem to understand that and to understand how to play it. Their political act, they, they don't want to be political actors, but they are, whether they like it or not. And if they don't start getting smart about some of these things, they're going to get owned because the conservatives are wrong to call the head of the JSB into parliament to account for this. This is not parliament's problem, but they're going to get cheered on by roughly 80% of Canadians in doing it. They're going to get cheered on by 80% of Canadians when they call Catherine Tate to the mat and say, what the fuck are you doing? Um, and when Catherine Tate gives bad answers, as I expect she will based on previous performance, they're going to clip that and they're going to use that against the CBC as part of a defunding or mandate shift campaign. And they're going to win. They're going to own the the, 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 the CBC on some of this stuff. Um, and the CBC is, is losing a game that it doesn't understand that's playing yet. And that is my concern. I agree with every word of it. And it all plays into the bigger thing that we've written about and spoken about on these podcasts so many times before, which is that the conservatives are in an open state of conflict with the media and it's not an accident. It's a strategy. Yep. This is something that they have chosen to do. And I think part of it is preemptive disarming of criticisms against them. I mm -hmm. think part of it is that it, the base loves it. And the base in this case is probably a lot bigger than the conservative support threshold because the legacy media in this country and even the independent media is unpopular. People don't like us. Mm -hmm. I mean, our subscribers like us. So please I mean, do we're click not, like We're not subscribe. supposed to be liked. That's kind of the no, role it's not we our job. serve in. Yeah, it's, it's not our job to be liked. That's literally the, not the role we serve, we, we serve in society, right? Um, Andrew Coyne, uh, it's, a, it's unrelated to the specific issue of uh, calling um, the CBC before Parliament, but he responded a bit to the infamous Apple interview, which mm -hmm. you and I actually hadn't talked about. I didn't really have anything to say about it. But what Andrew wrote, and I thought it was fantastic, it was that the, the way the media needs to start handling Pierre Polyev was to ask specific questions. And I think something that's been happening, and it's uh, a through line through many of the times when Polyev has uh, been able to get the better of a, a, a reporter or a columnist during an exchange, we spend too much time on Twitter impressing each other in this industry. Mm -hmm. yep. And I'm listening to a, a, a what is a question, nominally a question for the conservative leader, leader of the opposition, but it's not. It's a value statement. It's a yeah. speech. It's a soliloquy. And it's not being done to elicit information. It's being done to make a declarative statement of, I am opposed to you, sir. But it's mm -hmm. Jeopardy style in the form of a question. And I think Coin is bang on. If you are a reporter in this country or a broadcaster or a host or a journalist, wh whatever, and you have a chance to ask Pierre Pauly have some questions, ask him specific policy questions or ask him specific questions about actions or inactions. Mm -hmm. Do not open it up with a long-winded soliloquy about the state of the Western world and Donald Trump and respect yeah. for democracy. Ask him what he thinks you. the carbon tax should be. Ask yeah. him what his gun control proposal is. Ask him how, what he, how much GDP he wants to spend on national defense. Ask him about comments made by one of his MPs. Ask him about comments made by the prime minister. Let's see what he says. But as soon as you start making the, this ephemeral, esoteric, let's talk about our feelings He's going to eat you alive mm -hmm. every time because he's mm -hmm. better at it than we are. Mm -hmm. And there has been a wide, broad, and surprisingly persistent failure of our professional colleagues to get that. Mm -hmm. You've been warned, guys. We've been saying it from well, over a year. Uh, let's, also, let's also say part of the reason why the conservatives are running against the media right now is because they feel they haven't had a fair deal. And whether or not you want to argue about whether or not they have had a fair deal, you see, you know, that that okanagan reporter go off about some people say you're just like donald trump and asking these when did you stop beating your wife questions and you're like yeah if that's what you've been getting you haven't been getting a fair deal and fair enough for going to war against us if that's what if that's what it's been like did you so, see the cp like, correction this week no tell me the cp i didn't even read the original story the cp basically had to put out a correction of a story that had been critical of pierre polyev that seems to have been factually wrong on every key contention Oh, oops. And Polyev tweeted the correction. And he basically said, remember this the next time they're criticizing us. Yeah. 
Yeah. Because of course like, he's going at, to. Of course he's going to. And there was so much, and I saw, uh, particularly among some of the usual suspects in our industry, a lot of anger about that, a lot of criticism of that statement. Guys, when the CP has to issue multiple corrections for a single story, that's not yeah. Pierre Polyev's fault. And you no, don't get to mad that's about on it. Us. You don't get that's to mad at, get mad about how he spikes the football. Nope. You're missing Sorry. the point. That's the point. So anyway, um, and this also goes back into the whole fundamental problem with activist journalism and, and, and the degree to which it just undermines your collective professional credibility in the face of some of the some of the stuff. But anyway, get off Twitter. Um, just on don't that note, stop asking your questions to impress your colleagues. Start asking questions yeah. to inform the public. That's correct. Understand where your priorities and where your duties lie. Anyway, um, you, you have to go pick up your kid. I got to go pick up my kids. Jamie is still not forgiven me from going to the event last Toronto. So every time I drop him off, he cries. Ah, it's bad. Anyway, um, so I got to go pick up my little sweetheart, and uh, I think that that's I think that's it. I think that's it for us. I think it's it for us. Thanks, everybody. Bye.